there are approximately a lot of asteroids out there. There's a lot of them, and they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Well, I mean, they come in round and, and lumpy and some combinations, so you can pick somewhere on that spectrum between all the way round and all the way lumpy. That's pretty much it for asteroids. Most of the asteroids live in the asteroid belt, which is sits between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. And it's not like Star Wars or something where to get through the asteroid belt, there's rocks crashing everywhere and you have to con constantly move around and it's very dangerous. It's no, like if you're sitting on a typical asteroid, the nearest asteroid on average is going to be like millions of miles away from you. All right. It is Space is a big place, especially out there at the asteroid belt. There's not too many, too many. I mean, there are a lot of rocks by number, but not by mass. If you put all the asteroids together and try to make a planet out of it, it'd be like half the mass of, of, the, of Mars or something. Like, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but it's not a lot. It's not going to be a big planet. The asteroids uh, form, uh, they are leftovers from the formation of the solar system itself. These are pieces of planets that didn't get to become a, a piece of a planet. These are uh, pieces that tried to glue themselves together to become a planet and then either got smashed apart by a collision or torn apart by gravitational forces. Uh, there, there probably should have been a planet at the asteroid belt, but the gravity of Jupiter prevented planets from forming there, so you just end up with all the debris. We get different kinds of asteroids because of a process called differentiation, where if you're trying to build a planet, there's a lot of heat, there's a lot of stuff smashing in. It's basically molten. All the heavy stuff in a planet will sink to the core, and then all the light stuff will sink to the surface. That's why here on the Earth, the heavy stuff like the iron is in our core, and the light stuff like the nitrogen is in our atmosphere. But if you're in the middle of doing all that and you're all molten and you're just figuring yourself out and then you get smashed to pieces, all those pieces are going to go flying and the pieces will have a different compositions based on where in the proto planet it came from. So we have three main types of asteroids. One is the, called C-type or the chondrite. These are the most common by far because they come from the mantle or the crust part of a protoplanet. There's lots of clays. There's lots of water. There's lots of silicates. Uh, it's just a, if you scooped up a big pile of rocks and flung it into space, that's your typical C-type asteroid. Then second most common type is called S-type or stony. S is for stony. These are still mostly silicates, but they also contain a lot of nickel and iron. A typical S-type asteroid will have, to give you some idea, around a million pounds of regular metals and about 100 pounds of rare metals like platinum and gold. Uh, these come from regions in the protoplanets that are closer to the core. And then the most precious kind of asteroid of all are the M type. M is for metal, so metal type. These are mostly nickel iron, and they have 10 times the amount of metals that the S type do. So these are thought to be the very core, fragments of cores of protoplanets that got blown to bits billions of years ago. Like I said, most of the asteroids are in the asteroid belt between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. There are other populations of asteroids. Uh, there's a population of asteroids that trail and lead the orbit of Jupiter. These are called the Trojans. Same thing for the Earth. They're called the Apollos. There are also just a bunch of random asteroids on random orbits doing their own thing. Any asteroid that crosses within the orbit of the Earth is called a near-Earth asteroid. And there's a whole bunch of them that we track. Most of them we know. But there's a bunch we don't. It's actually kind of hard to track asteroids because they're small and relatively dim. Uh, so they don't reflect a lot of light. And so they're just kind of hard to spot. That's the asteroids. Okay, so what? Why do we care about asteroids? Why do we care about asteroid mining? The reason is all those metals, all that stuff. Like, think of all the metals that go into everyday life, like gold, silver, platinum, zinc, phosphorus. 
these metals, there's only a finite amount of these metals. And in fact, the vast majority of metals that we dig up and mine didn't come from the earth itself because all those metals, when the earth was just forming, were sinking to the core. Instead, later collisions by asteroids deposited more metals near the surface, and now we dig that up. But there's only so many metals, right? Uh, the, the total number of amount of gold that we have ever mined in the history of humanity fills something like five Olympic swimming pools. Now, sw Olympic swimming pools are large, but think about that. We've been mining gold for thousands of years, and that's all we've been able to find. And these gold atoms just keep getting circulated again and again and again. You know, sometimes they're a piece of jewelry. Sometimes they're in a circuit board. Uh, and then they're on a, a gold fleck on a, on a statue in a church or something. Like this, uh, we just constantly reuse this same gold because it's a finite resource. There's only so much gold and zinc and platinum out there in the world. And... You can easily imagine, as populations grow, as technology progresses, there might be more demand for these metals. We might want more gold if it's useful in our circuitry. We might want more zinc so we can make stainless steel. We might want more iron and nickel so we can build like everything in the world. But there's only so much of it to go around. Now, we can continue to access some here on the Earth. Like, we have all the metals that are easy to get. Like, if it's just laying there on the ground and we pick it up, we've already found all that. And if we continue to need more and more of that metal, the demand will go up, the price will go up, which makes it more profitable, more viable to dig down deeper, to get at the harder stuff, and you can still make a buck off of it. But eventually the price just goes up or or we recycle or we find different uses or different strategies like imagine a world imagine a world where nickel and iron rain from the sky like not literally because that would hurt but like we had an infinite supply of all the metals we could possibly want we had an infinite supply of gold infinite supply of silver infinite supply of zinc in infinite supply of nickel and iron what would imagine that world what would that look like? Well, the prices of these metals would plummet because it'd be as cheap as water and as abundant as water. But then we wouldn't be limited by those being finite resources, right? Anything involving these metals, anything made of gold would become cheaper. Anything made of zinc would become cheaper. Anything made of iron would become cheaper. And so all the things that we like to do to make our modern society so beautifully modern would become cheaper. Well, what if I told you there was essentially an infinite supply of metals right up there in the sky? And that's the asteroids. A single asteroid. Here's an example. 16 Psyche is an asteroid. It's moderately sized. It's about a mile across. Has about 1% of the total mass of the entire asteroid belt. It is an M-type asteroid, a metal type. There is enough nickel and iron on 16 Psyche that if we were to continue our current consumption rates of nickel and iron, like here's how much nickel and iron we use every single year, 16 Psyche would supply our nickel and iron needs for millions of years alone. That's just one rock. That's just 1% of the mass of the asteroid belt. That's crazy to think about. That's what makes asteroid mining so tempting because it's just there. You can see it. You can point to it. You can look at it with your eyes through a telescope. You can see all these potential riches and resources that we can just use so we don't fight over metals and the finite resource and we have to price it. It's just like, it's just there. Just grab it. So, but <laughs> it's challenging, which is why we haven't done it yet. It's challenging for a lot of reasons. Reason number one is 
Actually finding potential good prospect asteroids is more difficult than you might think because yes, we, we know of a bunch of asteroids their orbits are very difficult to track over time because they're constantly uh, gravitationally interacting with each other, uh, getting unevenly heated by the sun and changing their orbit. So actually change, you know, identifying good asteroids and for mining prospects, not scientific prospects, you need dedicated observatories. So before you even get started, you need to build some telescopes and buy some astronomers to run it and, and go prospecting and find what is a good asteroid and what's a good target? And you have to make a lot of considerations. And this is another challenge, which is actually getting to the asteroid. Like, let's say, okay, you know what? We're going to, we're going to, we're going to do 16 Psyche here. We're going to get its nickel and iron. We're going to make a bajillion dollars. Uh, but then you actually have to get there. And the big challenge with orbits in, in space is that everything's moving constantly and everything, con you need so much energy to to reach distant objects like you need a lot of energy just to get off the surface of the earth and get yourself into the earth orbit you need more energy to get yourself over to the asteroid you need more e energy to come back and then more energy to land back on the surface of the earth to give you an example uh, to to get to low earth orbit you have to change your velocity you have to go from zero essentially zero to around eight kilometers per second that's that's fast Eight kilometers per second is pretty fast and it takes a lot of energy, which is why we have big giant rockets to do it for us. To get from low Earth orbit to a typical near Earth asteroid takes another change in velocity of on average 5.5. So think of all the effort, all the rocketry, all the energy it takes just to get to orbit. And then you need half of that again to get to an asteroid and then half of that again to get back and then it, all again to land. That's a lot of energy. So yeah, 16 Psyche may be rich and full of nickel and iron that could supply our needs for millions of years, but good luck getting to it. Various studies have tried to do prospecting, finding good candidates for asteroids. They have identified around a dozen good candidates. These are candidates with potentially a high metal content. So makes them valuable. They're near Earth asteroids, so they're relatively close. And also the travel times to them is relatively short. It's all relative. I'm talking years to get to any asteroid. So that's what I mean by relatively short. But it's not like it's shorter than like going to Jupiter. If access to space continues to get cheaper, this list might grow from a dozen to around 100. But that's a big if. That's going to take years, if not decades to play out, to make that accessible, good prospect asteroid list a little bit longer. So you got to find a good asteroid. You got to study it a lot to make sure it really is a good prospect. Because remember, you can only study the surface and then you can get some handle on the density. And then you got to go from there to figure out how many metal, how much metals are in it, which is not an easy task, which is why you need to buy the astronomers along with your telescope. Then you have to get to the asteroid and then you have to mine the sucker. Um, how do you mine an asteroid? We don't know. Like th you know, think of mining equipment, like, like drills and shovels. Um, those all rely on the gravity of the earth. That if I drill into the earth, I know my machine is going to sit there and gravity is going to hold it still. Or if I'm going to dig, my machine is going to sit there. It's going to be held still by the gravity of the earth in zero G or the gravity of an asteroid. Like, these things are so weak, you could jump and reach escape velocity. It's if you drill, your your drill, your machine is just gonna like float away. And same for your big giant shovel. How do you actually do this in zero G? We don't know. You have to anchor yourself somehow. We don't have that technology. And if asteroids are like very just loose rubble piles, they're not like solid rocks. They're just really like piles of gravel. Good luck anchoring, anchoring yourself into that. Refining techniques in in some way rely on gravity where we heat up because, you know, no ore is perfectly pure. You need to heat it up. You need to melt it. You need to separate what you want from what you don't want. All those kinds of processes take gravity. We have no zero G refining technology. 
it's just hard. And then like, are you going to automate this? We have no fully automated mining operations on the earth. So how are we going to do it in space? Oh, if you're going to send people there, well, now you have to figure out how to send people to asteroids, which we don't have. Like, none of this is impossible. None of this is impossible. These are all engineering questions, not physics questions. So, you know, not my department. But I'm just pointing out mining asteroids is extremely difficult. And there's a reason why it sits more in the realm of science fiction than science reality right now, because it's hard. And we don't have the solutions for it. And you don't know if it's worth the effort. That's the challenging thing. That's why there hasn't been a lot of pushes to asteroid mining. Because you have to invest money in the telescope and the astronomers. You have to design all this new technology. You have to figure out how to mine in zero G. You have to figure out how to get all that gear and fuel and energy and possibly people and supervisors and, and hard hats and, and, and you know water bottles and just everything. Like go to a typical mine. I don't know if there's a mine close to you. Go to it and look and look at all the gear. Now imagine trying to send all of that into space. That's not an easy thing. And it's going to take a fortune. It's going to take forever, not forever, but a very, very long time to develop the necessary technology, actually run the mission and do the thing. And then you bring, let's say you you grapple onto 16 Psyche, you bring millions of years worth of nickel and iron back to the earth somehow. What happens to the price of nickel and iron? It collapses because it's as cheap, it's as, as abundant as water. So how are you going to make your money? Now, presumably the prices might crash, but then we'll think of all sorts of clever uses for iron and nickel. And then like new industries will spring up and we'll just make everything out of nickel and iron because it's so cheap. And then you'll make money, but not as much money as like the open market price for nickel and iron right now. So you don't know. You might invest decade upon decade upon decade to develop the technology and then make 50 bucks at the end of it. That's why no one's seriously investing in this and doing it uh, for real because it's so risky and you honestly don't know how much money you're going to make. You don't know how much it's going to cost and you don't know how much money you're going to make. And so businesses are kind of shy about doing stuff like that especially when we're talking like hundreds of billions of dollars of investment. Is it worth the effort? Well, let me give you a couple scenarios where I think it might be. One scenario isn't about using asteroids to fuel all of our metal needs for millennia but rather to use them as staging posts. Skip the M types, skip the S types. Yes, they're they're full of metals, but they're very, very rare. Go for the chondrites. Go for the common ones. No, they don't have a lot of precious metals, but they do have a lot of water. And if you want to explore the solar system, if you want to send missions to the moon and Mars, like the nearest source of water is actually the asteroids. You dig up asteroids, you get out the water, you can use the water as water to drink. Uh, you can also split it, stick a solar panel on there, zap it, split it into hydrogen and oxygen, uh, and then recombine the hydrogen and oxygen later inside your rocket because now you have a fuel. So these are fuel depots. Yes, that's also sci-fi. Yes, that's also far, far, far out. But I see the the technological path leading to using chondrites as refueling depots as more plausible, as faster than trying to mine asteroids and bring those resources back to Earth. You can, I can also imagine decades from now, because it's so expensive to bring stuff back to Earth, once you're in space, your best bet is to stay in space. So if you do have an M-type asteroid, it's better to use the resources there to fuel the resource needs out there, not bring it back to Earth. Like, if you're going to have an M-type or a an M-type asteroid, use it to build more rocket ships instead of bringing the metals back to Earth. I think that'd be a smarter play. 
But again, that's very sci-fi. That's all decades from now. Again, it's not impossible. I see that as a more plausible scenario than bringing the asteroids back to Earth, or sorry, bringing the metals back to Earth, but that's what I wanted to talk about next, is bringing the asteroids back to Earth. NASA had a concept called the Asteroid Redirect Mission, which was a mission to an asteroid, grab a boulder about 10 feet across, bring that boulder back into Earth orbit, and then we could study it on our own. You can imagine this as a viable mining strategy where you get to an asteroid, attach some solar panels to it and an ion drive, use the solar panels to power the ion drive, and slowly over the course of years and maybe even decades, nudge that thing back to Earth. Hope you did all the math right so you don't like destroy civilization. And then now that the asteroid is in Earth orbit, it's so much easier to get to. It's so much easier to dig around and play around to develop the technologies. I honestly see the future of asteroid mining actually starting with an asteroid redirect mission. The, that asteroid redirect mission by NASA was canceled, by the way. Too bad. And there are no others on the horizon but I see that as the viable strategy. Instead of trying to send all that mining gear halfway across the solar system, just try to bring an asteroid closer to Earth where we can study it scientifically, we can dig around, we can play around, we can get at the water, we can get at the metals, we can start doing something interesting. But really any space industry that includes asteroid mining is decades, if not centuries away. Because these are hard problems and the hard problems don't just go away because you want them to. And there's very little incentive to try to solve these problems. Maybe there'll be incentive in the future to try to solve them. It'll be worth the risk uh, to try and invest all the money and technology. Right now, it's just not there, which is why it's not happening much. So there is a future, but probably not in my lifetime. Thank you so much for watching. Please go to patreon.com slash PM Sutter to keep supporting this show. Like, share, and subscribe, and I'll see you next week. And, you know, you can be excited about asteroid mining if you want to. It's okay. <laughs>